Hello everybody and welcome back to your friendly neighborhood bow maths. It's been quite a while and I apologize for that. Life has been just brutally busy for me lately, but don't worry I'm not going anywhere. Videos might be a little less frequent from now on unfortunately, but they will still come out so you can look forward to that. So yeah, let's uh, get back into doing some math. And to recap, what we talked about last time was prefix, postfix, and infix notation. And these were basically different ways that we could write, well, math expressions. So for example, if we just wrote 3 plus 4 like this, where our operation is between the two numbers or the operands, that was what we called infix notation. And that's just the standard of what we're used to. But then we saw that we could put the operation before the numbers if we used what was called prefix notation. And if we wanted to put the operation after the numbers, we used what was called postfix notation. And prefix and postfix notation basically gave us a way to do our operations where we actually would never need order of operations, period, because you would either evaluate the expressions from right to left or from left to right in the order that they appeared. So we saw that if we had developed these as a society, as humanity, we developed uh, our operations with one of these two instead, maybe we would never have come up with the idea of order of operations. So now what I want to do today is actually connect these two concepts to language structure and show how it's actually even a little more strange that this is what we settled on instead of prefix and postfix notation. So admittedly, this episode is going to be probably more about linguistics than it is math, because the connection is only going to come at the very end. But I hope you find it interesting regardless. Subjects, Subjects verbs, objects. objects. So to kick things off, we're just going to do a quick recap on what subject, verbs, and objects are. If you're already completely comfortable with this, feel free to skip to the next section on dominant order typology. So the subject of a sentence is who or what is doing the action. So if we look at this sentence here, Bomaths solved a problem, who did the action here? Well, it was Bomaths, right? I did the action of solving this problem. The verb of a sentence is just the action. That's what we call the action in a sentence. So if we look at the same sentence, Bomath solved the problem, what's the action? Well, the action is over here, right? Solving the problem. However, we want to specifically look at the action piece. So the action piece is the solving, right? Solved. The problem is what I did the action to, which is what the next piece is going to look at. And so lastly, we have the object of a sentence. That's what the action or the verb is being done to. So when Bomath solved the problem, the object is the problem because that's what I'm doing the action of solving to, right? Okay, so that's just a simple rundown of what subject, verb, and object are, and the relationship between the three of them can be described as follows. So we have that the subject, Bomaths, does the verb, solving, to the object, a problem. Alright, so hopefully that makes it clear as to what these three are, and in most sentences we have these three kind of grammar forms coming up. Dominant, Dominant order, order typology. typology. Okay, so to understand what dominant order typology is, we first need to know a little bit about linguistics. So we know linguistics, that's just the study of languages. And linguistic typology is kind of a subset of that that specifically studies languages and classifies them based on various structures in the language. So maybe different commonalities with like the word types that are used or the grammar. And specifically the area of linguistic typology that kind of studies the grammar and maybe commonalities or differences across languages is called syntactic typology. And a part of syntactic typology is looking at what's called dominant order. So dominant order looks at the basic order in which the subject, which we'll abbreviate by S, the verb, which we'll abbreviate by V, and the object, which we will abbreviate by O, appear in a sentence. So when it comes to English sentences, if you just make a few sentences, you'll see pretty quickly that English is what's called a subject, verb, object language because the order that we make these sentences pretty much always appears where, where we have the subject first, then the verb, then the object of that verb. I love 
faux maths. So some languages that do this other than just English are French, Spanish, Arabic, and Chinese, and many others. Now we can change the order, right? And we could do subject and then object before the verb. I, faux maths, love. And some languages that do this would be Korean, Japanese, and Turkish. And as you might guess, there's languages that fall into any one of the possible six orders of the S, the V, and the O. Love, I, faux maths. For VSO languages, we have Irish or Welsh. Love, faux maths. I. VOS languages include Fijian and Car. And yes, there's a language called Car. Faux maths. Love, I. For OVS languages, these are pretty rare, but some ones are called. Hishkariana, which I did not know this beforehand. I had to look these up. They're that rare. Faux maths. I love. And an example of an OSV language is called Wararo. Waro? I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Okay, so these are all of the orders. Basically, the classification of languages into one of these categories. That is what we call dominant order, and that is a section of syntactic typology. All right, so now what we're going to do is we're going to connect this dominant order, which every language falls into one of these categories. These are the only possibilities. We're going to connect that with prefix and postfix notation. Dominant, dominant order, order and, and prefix, prefix postfix. postfix. Okay, so I want us to notice something with all of these dominant orders. If we focus only on the verb and the object, what possible orders do we get? We either have VO, OV, VO, V O O V O V. So there's only two possibilities, right? When it comes to verb and object, we either have V O or we have O V. So either the verb comes first and then the object, or the object comes first and then the verb. And here we're just kind of ignoring where the subject is. And the reason for that is when we think about applying an operation to numbers, we can kind of think about the operation as like the verb and the numbers as like the objects of that verb, right? So if I have something like 3 plus 4, we can actually say this in English as um, a verb and an object. I could say something like, I add 3 and 4. So writing it this way, we clearly get that, okay, adding here is the verb, and 3 and 4 are the object. And what's cool about this is this actually reflects what we get when we use prefix notation, right? We can write the addition first, and then the three and the four. And so prefix notation is actually really similar to the grammar structure of English, or the grammar structure of verb object languages, right? Where we write the operation first, which is basically the verb, and then we write the operands, or the numbers, after the verb, or after the operations. So that puts them in the object role. And so you might guess it's going to work the same for OV languages, but that's going to be postfix notation. So I happen to actually speak Korean. So one way we could say to add three and four is we could say So here, the three and the four, those come first, right? So that's still the object. But the verb, tohada, to add, that comes afterwards, right? So that is the verb here. Just to put a translation here, samguasare is three and four. And then tohada is to add. So what we see is this reflects perfectly postfix notation, right? The operands or the numbers, those come first because they're like the object. And then the verb comes afterwards, which is like the operation. It's kind of an interesting connection, but admittedly, it's kind of a small connection. But what I think is more interesting is the implication. A lot of the things that we make tend to reflect the language structure that our society works within. And so the fact that every language falls into either verb and then object or object and verb, to me, is kind of incredible that what we ended up on wasn't this prefix notation, wasn't this postfix notation, 
but rather was this infix notation where in a sense we kind of have the verb in between the two objects. And that's pretty rare when it comes to languages. Again, languages pretty much follow one of these two structures. And so I think it's quite interesting that we ended up settling on this and these ones didn't really come about too much, or at least we didn't finish on them, right? This is kind of the standard form that we always use. But in maybe some sense, that's kind of appropriate because, well, this is math. It's like a language in and of itself, and it's kind of a universal language in the sense that no matter what language you speak, we kind of do it in the same way. It's been standardized across the world. Concluding thoughts. So I hope you found that video interesting. Again, more of a language video than a math video, but I still think it's kind of a fun little, um, almost like a footnote on what we talked about with prefix and postfix notation, and maybe you'll remember it a little bit better. If you happen to speak a language where the verb comes before the object, maybe you will be more comfortable with prefix notation. And if you happen to speak a language where the object comes before the verb, maybe postfix notation is more your cup of tea. But regardless of the language you speak, I guess we're all unified by infix notation. And we're all unified by mathematics. So that's going to do it for me today. You have yourself a great day. Stay groovy, and I'll see you in the next video. Subscribe for more hardcore math. Bow maths.